I'm going to be talking about games and culture. What have they got to offer one another? <laughs> Actually, a lot of the question has already been answered by Kristen, which is, you know, if we're talking just about literature, then there's already a lot that games can do with literature. And so I guess I'm just going to be making that discussion a little bit wider by talking about uh, uh, this broader concept of cultural heritage, which includes many, many other things beyond literature. So firstly, a few words about myself. I'm kind of assuming that most of the audience here are game developers, so let's just say that like most of you, I used to be a game developer, and I plan to be, again, a game developer in the future. But right now I'm working on a, a PhD at Bond University in Australia, and my PhD explores using open world RPGs to transmit and to explore Australian Aboriginal cultural heritage. So that's how I ended up taking an interest in uh, the ways that game examine cultural heritage. And um, just very briefly to explain cultural heritage, uh, this concept, it's a word that we hear quite a lot, but uh, nobody ever really bothers to explain it because it's one of those all-encompassing things. Cultural heritage is all about pretty much any historical cultural stuff. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that for, for the moment. We'll get back to a, broader, a stronger definition of it uh, later. First, why are cultural heritage practitioners interested in games? So why are people who are interested in, in looking for ways to preserve or recreate historical cultural heritage, why are they interested in games? Well, that's very easy to answer. That's because uh, cultural heritage uh, you know, if we're, even if we're talking about uh, preserving a building, there's a lot of value to be had in creating a virtual version of the building for, so that people can uh, look at it. Uh, in many ways, in many cases, this can, actually, this can be used also to help protect a building from damage. One of the famous examples is uh, the ancient, uh, well, medieval Inca ruin of uh, Machu Picchu in South America, which is receiving so much damage just from tourists coming and visiting that a virtual version of it was uh, created a few years ago f explicitly to encourage people to visit Machu Picchu virtually and not damage it by being uh, by going there and uh, you know simply being there. Uh, but this presentation today is going to be mainly aimed at game developers. So th an important question here is what's in it for me? If I'm a game developer, what's the benefit of being interested in cultural heritage? And I'll get back to Kristen's presentation just for a moment here, because I think that's, you know, you see a lot of the answer there. Uh, imagine Kristen's Elsinore game, not as an adaptation of Shakespeare Hamlet, but just as a completely new story set in a castle, in a fic fictional fantasy universe, with a bunch of characters that uh, uh, were created for that experience uh, in particular. All of a sudden, you know, with all respect to the very interesting narrative uh, structure that Kristen has uh, shown uh, and talked about, all of a sudden that game starts looking a lot less interesting than it does when we're talking about it as an adaptation of Shakespeare Hamlet. So simply the, simply by taking a work of literature and using it as a baseline for a game, uh, Kristen's team has already gained a leg up in terms of world building, in terms of uh, thinking about game mechanics as well. And again, game mechanics are, are going to be one of those issues that I'm going to be talking about quite a bit uh, in, in this regard. Uh, just looking at Kristen's uh, as, as in our example, we can imagine that somebody would do what uh, Visceral did with uh, Dante's Inferno, which is to take Hamlet and to turn it into a bloodbath, uh, a third-person action game. Somebody could do that, it's conceivable. And we can see immediately that it would be a lot less interesting as an adaptation. So that's going to be one of the big issues that uh, I'm going to be discussing. Uh, so with that intro aside, the plan for this presentation is firstly we'll talk briefly a little bit more about what cultural heritage is, what role does it serve in video games. Then we'll talk about what is wrong with the way that we do things right now. What is wrong with the way we handle cultural heritage in so many games such as Assassin's Creed, such as uh, Skyrim, all these other games. And we'll focus in particular on two case studies. The first one being Far Cry Primal and the second one being Never Alone. Then we'll talk about what could be done to improve the way that we work. We, in particular, meaning game developers. Although, to some degree, also 
experts, scholars, historians, art historians, archaeologists, anybody who's dealing with cultural heritage as well. And then we'll conclude, hopefully, on a very positive note. But there's one thing that I want to be very clear from the start that we are not going to be talking about. I am not going to be saying that developers should be forced to listen to experts who know better. This is one of those attitudes that you see quite often in academic writing on this topic. And I think that this kind of attitude where academics try to tell game developers what to do is it's worse than just merely being wrong. It's actually useless because game developers have no reason to listen to academics, to obey them, I mean. They have plenty of reasons to pay attention to what academics are saying and to draw lessons from what they are saying, but they have no reason to obey them. So the moment anybody starts talking about what game developers should do or should even be forced to do, uh, that's the moment when people start uh, ignoring them. Okay, so cultural heritage this is a very, very broad concept and it can be divided into two different fields or, well, two subfields. Firstly, we have the tangible cultural heritage, anything that we can touch, we can hold it with our hands. Uh, so buildings, historical items, whether it's costumes, weapons, machines, anything at all like that. Then there's the intangible. Uh, so these are stories, literature, music, dances, language, even ideas, cooking recipes, memories of historical events, all these things are in some way cultural heritage. And all of these things uh, are considered worth, worthy of preservation by at least some people, uh, although very often these are very, con uh, very uh, contested concepts and that one person's uh, heritage will often be considered somebody else's uh, trash, something that not only does, does need to be remembered but in fact should be obliterated from memory. But that's a discussion we don't need to get into. So cultural heritage scholars and practitioners are people who, who examine cultural heritage and they usually seek to firstly document objects of cultural heritage, then they seek to preserve it if at all possible, and if this is not possible then they seek to reenact or recreate cultural heritage. And very often these days they are looking at virtual ways of doing this, so look, looking at video game technology and not just video game technology. VR, for example, doesn't necessarily lead to video games, but it's a, a very good technology to use for preservation of heritage. And the interest in uh, games from cultural heritage is quite obvious and natural in that games are the most dynamic form of uh, digital interactive media and they are very good at putting at putting uh, the audience in the role of, uh, of a participant, at immersing them in a particular world, uh, which is very, very good when you're trying to get people's attention, uh, which is also what Kirsten was saying uh, about uh, the difference between exploring Hamlet by watching a film and exploring Hamlet by playing a video game. One little caveat here, there's a reason that uh, the word preserve here is uh, written in quotes, because if you recreate a building in a video game, or if you recreate a place or an event or anything like that, well, you're not really preserving anything. You are recreating a digital copy of it, but you're not really preserving the original as such. Now, interestingly, even though there's been quite a lot of interest from cultural heritage practitioners in terms of looking at games and looking at ways that games can help them reach a wider audience, so far the track record of these efforts has been relatively poor. Because game developers, sorry, because uh, cultural heritage practitioners tend to uh, ignore certain aspects of video games, but we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Now, in terms of uh, games and cultural heritage specifically, games and cultural heritage are obviously inseparable in the sense that any video game with any form of narrative will have some attachment to real world culture. So anytime you know, whether it's, even if it's a completely fantasy game, it's still going to be dealing with real culture in some way or another. <clears throat> and uh, this means that potentially, if we're talking about games that use cultural heritage, we could go to the extreme of saying, well, all games use cultural heritage, uh, so let's talk about all of them. But that would be pointless because uh, most games don't use cultural heritage in a, meaning, in a meaningful way. 
Uh, obviously, merely including content that could be considered cultural heritage does not mean that you actually value cultural heritage and that you are presenting it specifically to to transmit it to other people. Very often culture can be used as a kind of replaceable form of window dressing for a video game. And I think a really good and powerful example of this is uh, the Assassin's Creed series, which actually does a very good job of showing off uh, different cultural settings, different historical settings. They put a lot of work into their into recreating the architecture, the unique feel of a place in a particular time. But at the end of the day, you're still an, an assassin running around on buildings, on top of buildings, and focusing on killing people. Uh, so not only is there a limit to how much culture can be explored, but also there's this sense of uh, replaceability that, yes, this particular Assassin's Creed game takes place in, for example, Victorian London, but it could just as easily take place anywhere else. And the game developers are not that interested in Victorian London as such. It's just a, a convenient background for this particular story. Why does this happen? Well, cultural heritage obviously is very valuable when it comes to world building, when it comes to building the background to your game, to the world that uh, your game is set in. So from this perspective, we value, we game developers value cultural heritage quite a bit without ever really even talking about the concept of cultural heritage. We see it as a source, as, as, as a place where we can go to find useful things to put in our games. Memorable events, memorable people, memorable places, all these things. For us, very often cultural heritage is a mere selling point. Uh, now I say mere selling point, but I want to stress that this is not a criticism that we use culture as a selling point. There's nothing wrong with trying to be profitable when you're making a video game. Obviously most game developers uh, produce projects with their own funding, or at least uh, the funding of a publisher, they need to be able to demonstrate that their project is going to be profitable. So there's nothing wrong with using cultural heritage as a selling point, but we can do more than that. So how do things go wrong between games and cultural heritage? I would argue, the main, the, and that's really the main message of this presentation, is that the conversation between games developers and people dealing with heritage is very superficial on both sides. So on the side of heritage, you often see this kind of approach in the, amongst academics. Look, how hard could it be to make a game like World of Warcraft? We'll just try to do it on the cheap with you know $200,000 or whatever a budget an academic can scrape up for a project. The results of such efforts are obviously not that interesting, or to put it uh, more brutally, they tend to crash and burn utterly, in which case you haven't really succeeded, or haven't succeeded at all. In the best case scenario, when a game like this is released, uh, it kind of uh, disappears into the void, <clears throat> in the sense that it doesn't find an audience because it's not an interesting game as such. On the game side, we twist our subject matter to suit our needs. Uh, this is the Dante's Inferno, Inferno case, where an incredibly deep and beautiful work of uh, medieval literature is boiled down to basically an extended action game. There is very little interest in Dante's Inferno in the subject matter itself, uh, and it's, there's very little interest in changing the game in such a way to better suit the subject matter. On the heritage side also, there's a constant concern about violence. For some reason, people tend to think that games contain a lot of violence. I'm not sure exactly why this is the case, but it seems to be. Now, this is obviously not entirely un unjustified as a concern, but it also leads uh, heritage uh, people to ignore the things that games do really well. And you know what, if we're talking about history, there is a lot to be said in favor of having violence in a game that, 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 that explores historical settings because there's usually going to be quite a bit of violence involved. <clears throat> now with games also, the other thing that goes uh, wrong is that heritage experts are hired very often for background info. So Assassin's Creed, again, Ubisoft does work with historians. They ask historians for input about what kind of weapons were used in a particular time, what would the city have looked like in that particular time. All these kinds of questions, but they would never, it would never really occur to most game developers to ask about advice on what the game itself should actually play like. 
And this might again seem quite reasonable. After all, people who, you know, a historian is not an expert in game design. What would they have to say about game design? But potentially that could be quite a bit, provided that we explain to them a little bit more about what we are trying to achieve. <clears throat> so let's move on to two case studies, the first of which is uh, Far Cry Primal, a game set in 10,000 BC, and it's uh, a, it's quite an interesting game in that, uh, in spite of obviously being a fantasy game where you can even ride around on a saber-toothed tiger and uh, you can use uh, your magical powers to remotely control an owl that helps you in combat, in spite of all these fantasy elements, uh, the game does try to recreate uh, to a certain degree an actual historical setting and a very interesting and unique historical setting at that. And it does it relatively well in terms of the environmental details. At the very least, there's no dinosaurs involved here, which is, uh, if we're talking about uh, a game set in prehistory, that's at least something to be thankful for. One of the most fascinating aspects of the game is the language that was recreated by experts uh, for the purpose of the game. So you have, a, obviously not a preservation, but a re reconstruction of what Proto-Indo-European languages might possibly have sounded like. In terms of uh, the artifacts you see in the game, it's also not a bad visualization of uh, Mesolithic material culture. It's a, it's a game that archaeologists actually talk about and uh, use to discuss uh, the Mesolithic. So again, it's one of those cases where a game that uh, was created purely for entertainment finds its way, its way occasionally into academic settings. But then things start going wrong, because if you look at the gameplay of uh, Far Cry Primal, it is ultimately just like every other Far Cry game out there. I really like uh, a, a video review done uh, about Far Cry Primal by a YouTube blogger who goes by the name of Super Bunny Hop, or George Weedman is his name, and he talks about his sense of wonder initially when he started playing Far Cry Primal, this idea that somewhere in Ubisoft, somebody stood up at that meeting looking at different ideas and they actually said, let's make a game set in prehistory and he wasn't thrown out of the window, he wasn't shouted down, they actually went for the idea. But as he played the game more, uh, the sense of wonder gradually dissipated into this great disappointment that, you know, at the end of the day, they really didn't have to do very much with, uh, with this game to make it uh, to, to produce it in terms of making it uh, more adapted to the historical setting. It's just like every other Far Cry game out there. For example, the material culture in uh, Far Cry Primal is such that you collect lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. That's not, uh, that's not the his history of a prehistoric setting. Uh, as far as uh, we know, it, the average person in those times would have been very happy to have just one good weapon and they would have uh, struggled to kill so many animals as you kill in Far Cry Primal and to obtain so many different items from animals. Also, they would not have a mini-map. All these things mean that the setting itself is basically wasted. It served as a marketing wrapper ultimately. So a good question here to ask is, would players really have hated Primal if it had included more Primal gameplay? If it had tried to make us feel more like, you know, what would it really be like to live in those times? What would it really be like for to have an action hero? Yes, still, we're still playing a video game and it's still a fantasy, but set in those times where you have to really you know, merely moving around the space, you, sh you should really be looking at landmarks rather than at dots on a mini-map. So much more could have potentially been done here. Now, the other example worth looking at uh, today is Never Alone. And this is a game that was done specifically for the purposes of cultural heritage. Uh, in fact, it was uh, developed uh, in very close collaboration with uh, with the Cook Inlet Tribal Council in Alaska. So it was developed uh, with the funding and with the direct collaboration of the Inupiaq community whose cultural heritage the game actually explores. So in terms of ways that we can collaborate with cultural heritage organizations and experts, this is almost a showcase for how we should be doing this, this kind of thing. And the game has been very widely praised for its visual style, for its cultural content, 
it hasn't been that wi widely praised for its gameplay, but we'll get to that. And in terms of the success it has achieved for cultural heritage, we can look at it this way. There is only about 13,500 Inupiaq people in the entire world. It's a very small community. And now their heritage has reached 400,000 people through this game. Imagine how long it would take for, for, for that to happen if we are talking about each member of the community going out and talking to people about their heritage. And it goes further than that because many, many other people have not bought Never Alone, but thanks to the game's publicity, they have heard about it and they would have taken some interest in it. Uh, Never Alone is also a good example here of, a, of an indie game which has gained commercial vi viability by looking at a unique subject. So we can imagine a game, an indie game just like Never Alone, the exact same gameplay but set in a more typical setting. You know, instead of having a little Inupiaq girl exploring this fantasy version of Alaska, we could have a little New Yorker girl uh, running through the streets of New York. And it probably would not be anywhere near a success. But that's also the weakest uh, link in terms of what the game does, because the gameplay itself, you know, you really could just replace the whole setting with New York and. Uh, and, and the game will still be the same. So the gameplay as such has basically as much to do with Inupia culture as uh, Mario, as all the Super Mario games have to do with plumbing. The, the game does contain lots of additional content which then lets you explore the culture, but the gameplay itself does not do it. So in terms of the key problems that are encountered with heritage in games, here's just a few few quick takeaways. Uh, firstly, heritage-oriented games tend to divorce gameplay for, from culture. So culture is used uh, to inform the background, it's not used to inform the gameplay itself. Now it may be that what's happening here is that somewhere behind the scenes there's a trade-off that's being made from a business perspective that, okay, we're going to be making a game in a unique culture setting, uh, so that's a risk, so let's not compound that risk by uh, having really innovative gameplay, which is undoubtedly a reasonable point to make, although arguably not always. So we do see many innovative gameplay experiences out there, but usually not in cultural heritage games. They usually tend to play it safe. Now we'll notice that this argument that I put forward about cultural heritage, it does not happen with other types of serious games that explore, not, uh, that explore subjects besides cultural heritage. So for example, no one ever would suggest creating a platform game to teach about nursing anymore at least. It used to happen probably, but not very, not anymore. And of course the devil's advocate response here is also that, you know, no one would actually try to make a nursing game and sell it to the broad public. So in this aspect, cultural heritage games are a bit different. So a key part of the problem, as I've uh, suggested, is a lack of deep conversation between uh, one side and the other. So heritage experts are very happy to harness game technologies, but they are often wary of what, of what it means to embrace gameplay uh, from video games as such. They, they don't want to end up uh, trivializing the subject matter. They don't want to fall to what, is, uh, what has actually been called by academics the Indiana Jones syndrome, where you create a game that explores a historical setting, but at the end of the day you've also trivialized the whole subject, uh, in the same way that uh, the Indiana Jones films have trivialized archaeology into something involving bullwhips and uh, fedora hats and shooting at lots of Nazis. Uh, so the devil's advocate argument here, of course, would be that if this is the only way that we're going to popularize cultural heritage, then maybe it's better not to bother. Uh, but that's a very pessimistic view, I would say. Game developers, on the other hand, are very happy to talk to experts when it comes to the content, when it comes to the background materials, but they don't talk about to experts, uh, to heritage experts about gameplay. And the devil's advocate argument here is, of course, that cultural experts, if you talk, if you ask a historian, about gameplay, they're not going to have a very informed answer. But again, that's probably a very limited view, uh, also because many historians these days are, are gamers themselves. Uh, so I argue that in both cases, a deeper conversation can produce lots of mutual benefits. And there's one important prerequisite here, which is that we have to understand both sides of the, 
in this conversation, you have to understand that content equals gameplay equals content. Uh, now, what the heck does that mean? Many of us uh, in in games development would have somewhere along the along the lines uh, heard that famous uh, during our studies at least we'd have heard that famous. Uh, quote from Marshall McLuhan, the communications scholar, that the medium is the message. In other words, uh, the, the medium that we use to convey a message strongly influences what the message is going to be itself. And in video games, this has been translated by Ian Bogus to, uh, this, uh, into the concept of procedural rhetoric, which is quite simply this idea that we are conveying messages through gameplay itself. A brilliant example of this is the game Papers, Please. Now, having come from a from a formerly communist country, I can say that this game is an incredibly deep exploration of what it meant to live in that kind of environment, where, where you know, very often you face these day-to-day -day choices: Do I collaborate and keep my family fed, or do I, or is this the line that I will not cross, but I will get, uh, but I will get fired in the process, and uh, what will happen to my family then? These are very real choices that are faced by very many real people, and. I don't, and I think Papers, Please did a brilliant job of exploring this, not through the story of the game, but through the gameplay, by, by putting the player, putting the player in a situation where he had, he or she had to make these choices constantly, and uh, over the course of the game, as you keep making these choices and the, and the whole thing starts escalating, you can you can then start to finally understand something that most other media would struggle to explain, which is why did so many people put up with uh, these awful repressive uh, political systems? Why did they collaborate with the system? And you know, were they evil to collaborate with the system? And in most cases, it was a case of simply trying to survive. And it's only when you play a game like Paper Cities that you can that you are able to get that. And all games, at some fundamental level, do convey some message through their gameplay. It's just that we usually don't think about it too much. For example, the Assassin's Creed series, uh, apart from being just an action game set in various uh, historical slash fantasy settings, it also contains this kind of classic revolutionary doctrine, this idea uh, that individual lives are worthless in pursuit of higher ideals. Uh, the game pounds this idea into you constantly by uh, by allowing you to pretty much do anything, kill anyone in order to achieve your objectives and still feel good about it because, hey, you're working for the good guys, apparently. Far Cry Primal and most other games also have this element of procedural rhetoric where a person's worth uh, is basically the stuff that this person carries. Uh, so it's not about the ability, it's not about your abilities, it's about the equipment that you have. Often, because we don't tend to spend enough time thinking about uh, these things, this leads to a very kind of conflicted form of rhetoric in our games. So for example, The Elder Scrolls uh, has you, one of the aims of the player in, in any Elder Scrolls game is to collect wealth, to accumulate wealth. Except as you keep playing the game, over time you suddenly realize that uh, there is no point in accumulating wealth in the game. Because in fact there is nothing of value in the game that uh, money can get you. Because all the best weapons, all the best items, anything that's, that has any significant value is are, are things that you can find somewhere in the world and obtain by defeating by defeating monsters, whereas the things that you, that you can only buy with money, uh, including housing, strangely enough, are so incredibly cheap that they cost next to no effort to obtain the fund, the, the money needed to obtain these things. So you have this strange situation where the retro, where the the surface kind of value of the game is you should be collecting wealth, you should be trying to 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 become more important in this world by accumulating wealth. And then as you look deeper into it, you realize that actually the game is giving the exact opposite message. What about Never Alone? What kind of procedural rhetoric does Never Alone contain? Well, it actually does have a very vital bit of procedural rhetoric, which is very, which would 
and, and also to be very important for the Indo-PAC people, which is that you never go out alone, which is, you know, oddly enough, the exact same message that, uh, that the movie Top Gun tried to co convey, which is that you never ever leave your wingman or you will die. Uh, so never alone does this uh, just very, very different means where you have to collaborate, where you have to cooperate between the uh, Nuna, the little girl, and her, and her white fox. Uh, but could there have been more than this? Uh, could there have been more in the sense of not having to, not having the gameplay come down to merely solving typical platformer puzzles? Uh, I mean, what message does the, the do the, these platformer puzzles convey about the skills needed to survive in the Arctic? Fundamentally, I would say this is a non-message. Basically, the game is saying that in the Arctic, if you're one of the Inupiaq people, you need to be able to run, to jump, and to solve puzzles. And because we immediately recognize this as a standard platform game mechanic, we reject it as information about the Inupiaq people. We reject it as, uh, in the sense that we don't think that we have really gained any knowledge about it. Even though the game does occasionally have you doing things which convey important information about uh, trying to survive in the setting, like, for example, trying to duck out of the way of uh, gusts of strong wind. Uh, but potentially, you could have had a much deeper level of knowledge being imparted in this game by having a gameplay experience that's, that teaches the player to value Inupiaq skills by making the use of these skills critical in the gameplay itself. Whether the, whether these, the skills that would be tapped here would be, for example, hunting, or it would be merely the art of navigating through this barren snow snow based landscape, that that's uh, something that uh, I, that I, I don't want to go too deep into uh, this kind of speculation. But there are, but we can imagine so many different ways that this experience could have been enhanced simply by looking more at those uh, skills. <clears throat> so how would we go about doing this? And again, I want to reiterate this point I said at the start, uh, we're not talking about coercing one side into listening to the other side. Whether it's uh, game developers listening to academics or, or academics listening to game developers. Games are about entertainment, that's their key strength and uh, it is important at all times to keep that in mind. And uh, very often it would be very much counterproductive to, for a developer or to try to make a game that's less entertaining just for the sake of being more culturally authentic. Even though technically that's what serious games very often try to do. But since we do value cultural authenticity in video games, as a selling point at least, <coughs> it is important to ask the question is why should we be the important to using culture for world building content? <coughs> why not also use it for gameplay? So getting back to Never Alone again, this is, as we said, a textbook example of collaboration between an organization uh, of the Inupiaq people in this case and game developers who made the game. So we can imagine that there must have been quite a bit of back and forth conversation about this game between the game developers and the, uh, and the Cook Inland in the Tribal Council. You know, so questions that might have been asked is, what kind of story would you like us to tell? Uh, what kind of game should, should we be making, perhaps? But I think that this conversation probably didn't go quite as deep as it could have. And some questions that I think they should have been asking, <clears throat> and just looking at the game, my impression is that these questions were not asked, is what is the core experience of being an Inupiat? Uh, what do the Inupiat people value? What do they do uh, in their daily life, or what did they do traditionally? How do, how do they live now? How did they live traditionally? And of these things that the Inupiaq uh, do and value, which of them would work very well in a game? Uh, so what was it that you did that was difficult? What was it that was boring and repetitive and would not make for good gameplay? So what is the kind of core gameplay mechanic, uh, if, you, if you can put it that way, of being an Inupiaq? These questions, I think, try, just having that conversation would have opened uh, a lot of new possibilities. Possibly you, uh, it would have involved also the game developer initially explaining this idea of procedural rhetoric and explaining the idea that the gameplay itself is the message, but that's obviously a step well worth taking. Now, moving, uh, as I'm just about uh, finishing up now, uh, so in terms of potential outcomes, 
we can see that already Never Alone and Far Cry Primal are both very interesting games in spite of their limitations. And the same applies to many of these other games that showcase cultural heritage. Whatever their limitations, there's, there's so much talk about uh, uh, Assassin's Creed, how much it has done for, uh, for uh, interest in the architecture of uh, medieval Florence or interest in the revo in revolutionary America and all these other settings that have been explored by the game. Skyrim has been widely praised for its exploration of Nordic culture, even though it's a fantasy game which takes ultimately very little of Nordic culture, but merely playing that experience has raised a lot of interest. But both sides can definitely benefit a lot by making stronger use of the other's expertise. Developers, and I would say especially in Uh, fundamentally uses the same gameplay mechanics that many other games uh, do, like World of Warcraft. You have a mini-map, you have your objectives, and you go with that. On the, other, on the other side of the screen you see Firewatch, which is a game that probably most of us are, have at least heard about. And Firewatch allows you to move through a forest and to navigate through a forest almost by relying on landmarks. Yes, you can look at the map and uh, and you can have a navigational marker in, in the game as well, but it's but the game becomes really interesting when you switch off that navigational marker and when you start moving through this world uh, trying to rely on landmarks. And all of a sudden you're in a much more interesting setting. And the way I see this, uh, as great as Virtual Mianjin is, and it really is a fascinating and amazing looking project, I would just love to to have its creators sit down and talk with the creators of Firewatch and trade notes on what works and what doesn't work. So that's basically all for today. But if anybody does have any questions, uh, my email address was on on the first slide of this presentation. So you're very welcome to contact me and ask questions then. Thank you. <laughs>